Death to the demoness Allegra Geller. Yum, yum. It's time for a tasty and refreshing snack. You know who I can do without? I can do without the people in the video store. Which ones? All of them. They never rent quality flicks. They always pick the most intellectually devoid movie on the racks. And now, on with the show. In a society driven to extremes, two people met by accident. Were you badly hurt? I think we saw each other at the hospital. You haven't told me where we're going. I haven't. James Ballard has been seduced into a secret world. The car crash is a liberation of sexual energy. Where the only way to connect is to crash. That's the future, Ballard. It's something we are all intimately involved in. Why are the police taking this so seriously? They have no idea who we really are. Now, they'll do anything. Describe it to me. To feed their obsession. Is there something here that interests you? This interests me. From the provocative bestseller by J.G. Ballard comes a film directed by David Cronenberg. James Spader, Holly Hunter, Elias Coteus, Deborah Cara Unger, and Rosanna Arquette. Crash. You coming? Hello and welcome to the final week in our Cronenberg uh, Loose Cannon Halloween Spectacular Retrospective slash some filmography look back. I, I'm running out of ideas here, <laughs> but uh, we are back for the final, uh, which is discussing a couple of his films from the 1990s as well as the 2000s. Uh, some we strategically skipped. Uh, some were just made more sense to pair together if that that will make sense as we go along uh but uh i am obviously not alone it's alex the producer here with uh my co-host who has been way way overworked lately and i think he's going to take like a a nine month nap after this isn't that right michael oh my god it feels like that like literally the second this podcast is over i'm taking some edibles and i'm going to sleep (laughs) until noon tomorrow I am so freaking tired. Some hibernation going on. Yeah. Pretty much. Yes. Well, the the, the real question is maybe you're just stuck and you can't tell whether you're still within the game or not. But yeah, exactly. My, uh, my uh, bio port has been plugged. We we, we will discuss that a little bit. And of course, we have uh, resident 50s, 60s uh, horror movie expert. And so far, until today at least, not Cronenberg liking friend. Uh, Aaron Pollier, but you know what? I, I have like Cronenberg films. I liked his early stuff. That okay? That that is right. You like his very early stuff and his very late stuff. It's the middle ground. That <laughs> yeah, and I think he might. You know, looking at Crimes of the Future, I think he might be going back to that kind of middle middle period. Yeah, it's it's very possible. Um, he's in his comfort zone. It looks like with Viggo Mortensen and a couple other actors that have worked with him previously. Uh, he's filming that overseas, which he's only ever done once before, which was for Eastern Promises, which we'll get into. So who knows if that has – who knows if COVID in itself – like, I, I won't be surprised if COVID played a very big factor in his decision to go back and remake this movie. Hmm. Uh, simply because maybe reflecting on his own mortality – I don't know if I shared it with you guys before we get into the movies, but his latest thing is a, like, two-minute short film – where it's him staring at his own death and mortality and he oh, sees himself grim. it's it's him looking at a life realistic uh model like 
mannequin of himself in a coffin and then he crawls into bed with it and snuggles up to it and that's the film what in the actual yeah. fuck <laughs> it was all over the national news a couple weeks ago and i'm like what is this and it's like yeah he's, him coming to terms with his own mortality he gets into into the coffin bed with his his coffin self and then like kisses himself and then goes to sleep <laughs> I'm like what is that? and people are like oh my god is he announcing that he's got cancer he's dying and it's like no he's probably just fucking with you uh if anything yeah. i mean his son has done a couple films now and he's sort of leaning heavily into the same body horror type stuff uh and i think his daughter's like a a clothing designer or like a costume i think she does costumes for films so like this family's in the business so we'll see what happens there but yes uh, for this, as I said in the previous shows, we are skipping a couple films. Uh, we skipped uh, uh, Naked Lunch, which would deserve probably an entire episode to dissect one time. It's also very weird, like probably the most gross and weird out of all of his films. Although Crash is another story we'll talk about. <laughs> <laughs> That's gross for a whole different reason. Uh, as yeah, far as... Yeah, yeah. uh, <laughs> and then uh we skipped m butterfly oh if only because it didn't really fit with the thriller horror sort of motif that we're going for for this halloween retrospective uh and then of course we skipped some of his later 90s ones but first we'll get into crash which uh on advice of both of us i think birdman we told you to maybe skip that one simply because you were gonna have to watch it at your house and and you, like you said before your wife has uh, some ptsd when it comes to uh, accidents so this would not be a good film for you to watch if she's walking by <laughs> yeah exactly so i i decided to skip this one i focused on uh existence i did history of violence and i did um uh eastern, eastern. promises so i guess aaron and i can briefly talk about crash because it's one of the few i had never seen but i had heard was kind of notorious i know it won a bunch of awards at the Cannes film festival for audacity and daring and i'm like okay is, aren't all his films like that and then you're like no this is different <laughs> see i and i have a story to tell about crash even before we get into how effed up yep, it is go ahead um <laughs> I, this was a date movie for me which is very strange it, it did get released in the united states and at the time i was dating a girl who liked cronenberg films and had said that she had enjoyed scanners and uh and videodrome and she hadn't heard anything else except that Cronenberg had done this new film called Crash. Let's go. Let's go see it. It's going to be in this theater in Chicago. <laughs> and, and it was it was one of the films that in the states you had to seek out. It was not playing yes. at most theaters. <laughs> yeah, we we had to drive uh, a couple hours into Chicago to see it. And boy, was that a uh, that's that's a date movie. Not really, but <laughs> well, that, I mean, I mean, if your date is awesome, sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, she she liked Cronenberg movies, but she was a little disturbed by that uh, by Crash. This was uh, this was a not very stand, it's not standard Cronenberg, really. It's much more something you'd figure a French filmmaker would make. It's very European. Yes, um, in that there is fairly detailed sex scenes in it. Yeah, and 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 even for the mid nineties, uh, not just like homosexual undertones we're talking everything is fair game which was surprising for a a big like it was a wide release in canada um and it ended up making like 24 million or 25 million dollars on a nine million dollar budget so it was successful it, yeah. it, considering that it only had a release i think in art house theaters in europe a wide release in canada and a limited release in the states Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I think it became one of those films that word of mouth made people go, oh, my God, I got to go see that. I can't believe they're showing this in theaters. And it has like a 63 percent fresh on Rotten Tomatoes, which you wouldn't necessarily think so. Uh, like Even Roger Ebert gave it three and a half out of four stars. I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah, not with the subject matter. But I mean, should we cover what the subject matter is? Because I mean, uh, it's... yeah, I, I mean, it, it's it's based on a book, I believe. Um, yeah. And and the adaptation was uh, done by Cronenberg. Like he he transferred it to make it a screenplay to make it, I guess, a little more not not necessarily palatable, but make it into the cinematic framework where it wouldn't necessarily work that way normally. But it's about people that are sexually aroused and obsessed with car crashes and the injuries that 
they get from that they personally get from having being in car crashes yeah it's it's kind of like they they feel alive after coming so close to death in some ways and i don't know it's it's a thriller but it's it's not the thriller that you're thinking (laughs) no it is not a thriller that you're thinking um there's if there are people that have any kind of chemistry on screen they will have uh intimacy (laughs) of some sort or another and even if they don't (laughs) they seem to have it yeah everybody it's what one one review i read says everyone's basically an omnisexual in this in this movie uh it, it doesn't matter who the people are as long as they're there and sharing in this experience yeah as long as they they they're all attracted to the sensations of, that they're feeling of watching the car crashes and it doesn't matter if you went into this this world straight gay by whatever it doesn't matter the shared experience is all they care about and that's what gives them their pleasure Yes, and there's like recreations of certain famous car wrecks. Yeah, in it. Spe- specifically uh, um, James Dean and uh, the uh, Jane Mansfield. Yes, and so, yeah, and, and, yeah. And I, it, I don't know how much we can really talk about it. I mean, they we are say, because like, it goes pretty far. Yeah, like it's it's rated NC seventeen in the states. It got an R in Canada, but it's. Like we don't have an NC seventeen. Our R encompasses what you would consider a hard R or an NC seventeen. So it wasn't. It's not. It's not. Didn't get an X here. But I guess an, an X would be an NC seventeen in the states. I think you guys. That's how it's categorized or something similar. Um, and it's it's not like it's unearned. <laughs> like the, yeah. One of the opening scenes uh, it, in, involves. Uh, James Spader is playing a producer on a film set and it involves him having sex with one of his, uh, I think camera operators. Uh, and it's, it's, it's nothing you wouldn't see in like a softcore porno. <laughs> um, yes. the, the amount, like it's, it's not just, Hey, Hey, here's a missionary sex scene for every R rated film ever made. It's, it's more graphic than that and involves more than you'd expect. And it oh goes boy. on from there. Yeah. <laughs> we'll say off the air mike and tell you what it is oh, um <laughs> and and eventually there's like scenes where people have sex in cars and uh th- they're more than a little sticky afterwards and it's gross <laughs> to the point where it's like really you got to i can tell certain scenes i'm like this is what was cut to get the r rating <laughs> um yes yeah I mean, there is full full nudity in this yeah there's- yeah and, and, and very descriptive like people wanting to hear like they want to hear descriptions of them having sex with other people so they can imagine it or like describe to me what what the car crash was like describe to me what your injury was like so that they can get pleasure from them describing their trauma yes it is it, it's there's a lot of things in here that can trigger people to be fair yeah. um it's a pretty intense film in certain ways but i mean if if you're okay with like violent car crashes um but it's never there's no jump scares there's no like oh my god explosions there's none of that it is yeah it's it's at a deliberate pace nothing in it is going to scare you you may be mortified by their actions yes exactly so i mean approach this movie with care is what i would say Um, yeah And, and and yes as we said off the air michael uh james spader gets it on with casey jones from team nt oh well that's delightful Yes, Daniel Jackson and Casey, Casey Jones. Yeah, yes. my my thing that I've said all for for years is yelling Daniel Jackson. No, oh yeah, pretty. It's <laughs> it's it's pretty. It, yeah, it leads up to that, and it's pretty, it's pretty intense for what you for like. I'm like 1996. How did he get away with this? And you find out. Oh, they showed it at art house theaters, and then they get released in the states on VHS for years. They had to have a cut version, and to get the uncut version, they had to import from Canada. It's like that makes sense. See, to, to put it to put it in perspective, like Showgirls was NC seventeen, right? Yeah. Showgirls is tame compared to this. Yes, very, very tame compared to this. Yes, I mean, Andy Sedaris looks like you know a Quaker filmmaker compared to this movie <laughs> it, there there's almost never more than five minutes that go by without somebody diddling somebody else 
it's wow. The, the, like it's it's it, everybody has their paws on everybody for every little reason and surprising amount of star power. James Spader, Holly Hunter, uh, Elias Cotius, Deborah Cara Unger, Rosanna Arquette. Um, I think the only person we don't see have sex in this is uh, is Peter McNeil, who plays the one of the stunt car drivers. And there's he because you see him in a couple crashes and he's there, but he doesn't get involved with it. But everybody else, if they're on screen, they eventually have sex with um, everyone else. <laughs> with, with, with with everyone else, and there's there's probably some deeper meanings in it. Um, like it, it's it, it. I would say it's worth watching. It is not something to have on with. Like if you got kids walking around your house, hell no, no. no. Believe me, no. Yeah, no, no. You, you like you would think you were watching a porno for most of it. Yes, it it, it is. That's what I would compare it to. Is it, it's it's a very well done porno. It is very well acted. The, the and, you know yeah, and, and that's why I have it sort of. You could almost like if you told me, oh, this is um, you know Bernardo Bertolucci direct like an Italian or a French director directed this it, over overseas. I'd be like. Oh, I get it. Like, like they they make films like this. Um, it's just not something you're used to seeing over, you know, stateside. Especially with, you know, all American and Canadian actors. You're like, what? So yeah, I, I, interesting. Check out a trailer for it. Uh, be aware when going into it. That's what you're getting. <laughs> uh, but it still has Cronenberg sort of traits for the way he filmed it. Um, this, uh, if you're going for like a double feature, this is not. It's it's listed as like an erotic psychological thriller. Don't pair this with like nine and a half weeks. <laughs> it's not the same kind of psychological erotic thriller. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I don't know what you would pair this with, really. Uh, I, I mean, my first my first instinct would say like Basic Instinct, but I no, not even that. That doesn't. Um, there's a Canadian film called Where the Truth Lies, and it had a similar backstory where. I saw it in theaters, the Canadian version's uncut, the American version, um, they only had a cut version, so people were driving up. Like, when I went to see it in the theater here, there were people in the theater that drove up from Buffalo because they wanted to see the movie. Uh, and it starred um, Kevin Bacon and somebody else. And it was, like, a murder mystery thriller, and it had some pretty graphic sex scenes in it, too. Um, which was really surprising. And it often got compared to this so maybe you could do a double feature with that but it's kevin bacon colin firth uh and a few other people and again it cost 25 million this one only made three million uh but i remember like half of my theater were made up of americans that drove over the border wow uh, so like sometimes you'll get that where it's like oh if you want and i remember at the time uh they were talking about it on tv in the states if you want to go see it go up to Canada because like 20 minutes of the movie was cut to show in the States. Uh, but yeah, so very, very few films exist that are like this uh, and we can move on. Uh, and Michael will, again, we'll tell you off there just some of the stuff. It's like, Oh my God. But well, one more thing. Can I talk about crash? Yes. One, one thing um, I think it is, and I'm, I'm trying to find the, it, it's Rosanna Arquette in this. Yes. Her costuming is actually really cool. Oh, her, 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 her like metal body cast slash. It looks like something from the future. Yeah, it, it is interesting. She has like this BDSM body cast type thing that she wears kind of near the beginning of the film. She has like this black lace on underneath it. And it looks it, like she ha she's has she had her, one of her legs r removed or, or there's a compartment within the cast that she holds her weed in. It's a compartment. I think she still has both of her legs, but I think there's scars on them. Yeah. Um, really deep scars. But regardless, just the, the costuming and, and especially Rosanna Arquette's costuming in this actually is kind of a standout thing in my it, mind. It's something you would like you would have thought you'd see in like a Blade Runner or yeah. like 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 the dystopic future. And and they, they make a point like I've never seen actually. You're right. Like it holds her her it goes up to like her waist and holds her back sort of in place. And then it's like one leg is it's almost like an exoskeleton. Yeah, and but it like there's there's a a bodice that is only covers one breast and in it there's like a cutout in it as well. Yeah, so it's weirdly erotic in that way. 
Every oh yeah, by the way, Michael, everybody's nipples are get shown. Everybody's nipples. Yeah. For, for if a nipple can be shown, it's shown. Including Casey Jones. Yes, and his butt. Well, there we go. That just sold me. <laughs> I need to see Casey Jones and Daniel Jackson make sweet, sweet love to each other. Well, and what's weird is like after this movie, like this movie came out. Then the next movie that was like the big starring feature for Spader was Supernova. That really terrible terrible movie that got i think alan smithy to death by different directors uh it, it was filmed in and, like 90 it was filmed in like the, 90 something like i think 90 98 and then i think it didn't get released till 2001 yeah. or something yeah, like this yeah like this came out in 96 it was they filmed it in 97 and part of 98 and then it got shelved till 2000 or 2001 so when it came out he already looked like old man that like he does now where he was like balding wearing the the, the wig and then had, had his gut it's like so even though the movie came out, he didn't even look like when he was promoting the film, he didn't look like the same person because he aged so much in six years. See, I was so confused because the first uh, movie I ever saw James Spader in was Stargate. And then I find out years later, he's the guy from the blacklist yeah. and he's the voice of Ultron. And I'm going to say yeah. the fat old guy. It's because he did, he appeared on the practice where he still had hair, and then he did Boston Legal with Shatner, and and the office. He, he yeah, and he had gained like 50, 60 pounds, and then lost all his hair in the span of five years. Was it just like a diet thing, kind of like a uh, Richard Dean say, Anderson say I'm going to have fun well, now or what? He was well, he was like an eighties teen idol sex symbol guy, right? Oh, okay. And he he was that from like eighty seven to like ninety seven. And then he's just like, fuck that. <laughs> okay, I think so he, I think he just he's stopped just working him. out because Stargate comes out and then his very next movie is Crash. Oh. oh. And then his next movie <laughs> is Supernova. And in Supernova, he's still like this buff dude and like in really good shape and still has all his hair. And then it's like, and then right after that, like that movie comes out because obviously the delay. But while that film is out, he's already like looking about 15 years older. So I don't know what happened. Maybe he just gave up. Maybe he just it was like, screw it. I don't care about diet anymore. But and, and then he's now sort of settled in that role of like authoritarian middle aged guy. So if it works for him, it works for him. Right. Um, but yeah, uh, I would say with Crash, interesting, not what you'd expect. Um, and yeah, moving on. <laughs> There's an intimacy involved in playing existence that is beyond description. They just pop your spine with a little hydro gun. Break out of your cage, Paco. I haven't crippled anyone yet. Step into my office. Now I'm warning you. It's going to be a wild ride. The new millennium. This is amazing. Will bring a new experience. You're the power source. We'll see how natural it feels. Where the playing field is a parallel universe. The game's a lot more fun when it starts feeling realer than real. No use fighting it. I don't like it here. You think it's infected? It's not infected. It's just excited. I think we're still inside the game. We have enemies in our own house. I do feel the urge to kill someone here. Do it. It's just a game. Something's wrong. Oh, God. What happened? Let's come back here with us. His, yeah. ne- his very next film, uh, or the very next Cronenberg film, was Existence. And the background here is interesting. I think it was released either a week before or a week after The Matrix, which severely, severely affected its box office. 
uh, because at this point, this was the most expensive Cronenberg film made, $31 million Canadian, so roughly 25 American. Um, and you wouldn't necessarily see it upon first look till you realize that it has a lot of CGI in it at a time when that was still new. Um, and it, it, it's where the Matrix was all about what if you were inside of a computer simulation and you didn't know it, but then you took this pill and you could see how the world changed. This is more, there's not robots, it's that our perceptions of reality are changing and how can you tell what's real when you're using a computer uh, program to tap your mind into the internet, basically. Which is kind of, like, I kind of talked about this a little bit when we talked about um, Videodrome and I talked about how it's sort of like the Matrix in the regards when Morpheus says, how do you define reality other than electrical impulses determined by your brain? Like in, in essence, reality is interpretation at best. And existence posed a few interesting questions. And I'm very heavy in the cyberpunk, like obviously stuff like the matrix, but I also read a role playing game called um, shadow run and shadow run. They deal a lot with cybernetics the internet which is just known as shit trying to remember what they call it in shadowrun the matrix duh and they also (laughs) talk about biosynthetic organs and when they talk about the organs or game pods in existence they're basically a creature that is alive and you plug into a port that's in your spine, which connects up to your brain. And they make several references in the movie to, Oh yeah, this is no different than than going down to the mall and getting your ears pierced. It's no big deal. Things don't get infected. It's a simple shot in the spine, bingo, bango. You're good to go in like half a day. And I thought the idea was remarkably interesting because There's a point, like in the first like 20 minutes, not even, where one of the uh, side characters gets assassinated by a biological gun when they swept him for bugs and they're looking for recording devices with like a metallic wand. They don't find anything. Kind of of, uh, predates uh, the idea of uh, 3D printed plastic weapons, eh? Kind of, yeah. But this one was specifically made out of biological parts it's known as the gristle gun yeah the fishbone gun wouldn't you like to have that for your collection it fires teeth (laughs) yeah it's so weird but i thought that's an interesting idea just the fact if you could bio if you could grow organic weaponry that's not a terrible idea it's horrifying but it's not a terrible idea and i and I, i guess you could look at um video games where they do similar terrible things with genetics and biomechanical stuff and that would be stuff like resident evil uh either the video games or the movie when it comes to bio organic kind of weaponry and cronenberg touched on some interesting things in that movie because um i guess to give you a very quick kind of summary of it there there there's this company called i think they're called antenna Uh, or something uh well yeah i think it's antenna whatever but the other one is pilgrimage like this gets to be very inception like with layer upon layer yeah uh so they're testing out this new game called um existence who's developed by this uh programmer named allegra uh geller and she's a recluse but she's known for programming all these awesome games for whatever reason so they're given all these new biological game pods and they all kind of jack in and experience a simultaneous reality but then this assassin shows up says death to the demon allegra geller okay and as we talked about she gets shot with the teeth gun and then jude law who's almost unrecognizable at times because he has um, hair and he speaks with an american accent yeah it's <laughs> weird like he has a very distinctive face um like i re- i think one of my favorite roles of his just as a quick sidebar i loved him in artificial intelligence as um gigolo yeah. joe i well, i loved him in that this predates a lot of his other work um mm-hmm. Like he, he, a lot of people probably know him from like Enemy at the Gate, mm-hmm. um, and and like prior to this, 
he had only really done like one movie that was big in the states and that was Gattaca. Yeah. So like he did Gattaca, then he did this, and then after this it's like talented Mr. Ripley, Enemy at the Gates, AI, Road to Perdition, and that's when his career really took off. Yeah. So so he was a relative unknown. Yeah, like and also random surprise ninth doctor, uh Christopher Eccleston. Eccleston. Yeah, yeah, I was so surprised. Like, really? So, I was yeah. I yeah, I really thought that was very cool. When I saw saw him, I'm like, is that really him? Yeah, it is. Yep. Oh my god, yeah. You got him, so, and, you, and you got Ian Holm, uh, also known, I guess, Ash, the most. Bilbo yeah. Baggins. Yeah, I was going to say, prob- yeah, probably most known for that. But but again, lots of character, you know, actor roles for him. Um, Callum Keith Rennie, you probably know as the guy who's in, like, every Canadian sci-fi show, including, like, Battlestar Galactica. He plays the guy that's the, uh, I guess he's the cashier at one of the stores, and he's... Hmm. He's the he's the rebel guy that comes in at the end with the machine gun, telling him they're at war. There um, was one character in this, and I didn't know he was a buddy of Cronenberg's, but he's been in almost everything he's ever done. I don't remember the character's name, but I can tell you precisely where I know him from. Okay. Uh, in Jason X, which Cronenberg was in and dies, um, there is a person who gets a phone call and the guy's on earth and he's like hey man i've got this crate of uh, i've got this really awesome find and he's like oh Oh. is another crate of dvds and it's this older uh weapons dealer robert a silverman yeah that's it Uh, he's in existence naked lunch scanners the brood rabid jason x yeah and i was like i could because he has a very distinctive way of speaking and i was like is that the Jason X guy? And that was kind of fun. So, so anyway, as Alex said, they start to discover there's different layers of reality because when you play Existence, there's another thing you can pick up, which takes you into a deeper layer of the Existence experience yeah, where they're working like, in a factory. Yeah. Like the game, pods. The, ga- the game that they're playing, like you don't realize it at first. You think that they're just going to go play a game. And it's like, what, what's the game? Oh, it could be the one game they mentioned is like high fantasy and all this sort of stuff. But they end up in a world very similar to the real world where you're under attack from realists or people that believe in reality versus having the ability to play games. Like they think that that's ruining the human race. And within that, you have to get to the next level, you have to find another biopod, jack into that. And we go Inception style where we go a game within a game. And that's where they start to, it goes a little off the rails where you're part of the, you're like a secret sleeper agent trying to figure out how the biopods are made and sabotage the biopod facility. And along the way, some characters appear multiple times as different characters because they're NPCs farther in. Uh, Willem Dafoe is great as the creepy gas station owner who's just which is gas. weird because this was a couple of years before he did Spider Man and this was after Speed Two Cruise Control and this is probably around the same time he did Boondock Saints so he's really in top form here despite he's only in this movie for like ten minutes maybe but yeah as Gas you're right he's great but he's so weird he's so willem was, dafoe i would love I was just, to i was gonna say you just realized that you just described willem dafoe as willem dafoe yeah it's yeah. so weird <laughs> like he's so out there but it works so and, i i think the whole movie is weird though it, it's i, I it, it's i enjoyed crash for what it was as weird and bizarre and strange as it is but th- this seems so disconnected from reality and from like other parts of itself that it was really difficult to get into it, um, it's it, it, I, it's the first one i ever saw actually i rented it on dvd uh and i was like what is this and then that's when i went back and watched all his other stuff because i remember my local video store had a sticker on it and it says watch this if you like the matrix even I though don't the, see a comparison to Matrix, and, there. and I it was kind of do, well, but you really got to dig for it. Well, they came out like two or three weeks apart, and then I guess the idea was the Matrix was all the big rage. It's like, do you like you know being sucked into virtual reality? And every movie that had like, it was like this, hackers, everything that had anything to do with computers had a sticker on it saying "Watch if you like." So I was like, okay, 
I'll rent it. And it had another big sticker on it that I think Rogers Video used to put on a lot of their tapes. Anything that was Canadian, it had a, a maple leaf on it. Sometimes it meant you get it for cheaper to rent. Uh, so I was like, oh, Canadian stuff. It's only like two bucks for a week. Okay, I'll rent it. And then I watched it like three or four times. I'm going, what? Every single time I watched it, more and yeah. more what? I had to rewatch a couple scenes because I was like, what? Although well, there's one scene of this, and I'd love to hear you, your guys' take on this. So, okay. um, so uh, Allegra and Pykel are at the Chinese restaurant, and they're asking oh. for the special. And there's, there's one line of dialogue that sticks out to me so much. There's something in my soup. Uh, no, and I'm, and I'm very angry. <laughs> no, not that. Pykel stands up. Oh. Oh, okay. There are two lines in this, but he's like Chinese waiter, and it's just the way that he yells it. It's <laughs> well, so because, fucking because he's called because he, he doesn't know how to call the NPC, so he doesn't have the NPC doesn't have a name, so he just calls Chinese waiter. <laughs> and then there's this other one. Re- Existence is pod head plant. I well, died laughing at like three thirty well, in the morning watching well, this. Well. well <laughs> I found something in my soup and I'm very angry about it. He shoots him in the, I won't, he's like, I won't shoot him. He's too nice. And then she's like, just go with it. The programming of your character is going to sort of force you to do it anyway. So you may as well enjoy it. And he shoots him in the, and like one of the few moments that feels like a Cronenberg movie is just shoots him in the face and just how his face shreds away. Like they used the cheese grater on it. Yeah. And he kills him. And then the, the line, like everybody's staring at him, the entire, the, all the NPCs are like, what? And he's like, uh, sorry, there was a, uh, disagreement over the check uh nothing to see here please enjoy your lunch and they all go back to like resetting their positions <laughs> yeah because they're all npcs i most of these most of the scenes in the movie are kind of like that there when there's just like dialogue between like let's say ted and allegra the dialogue's pretty good but anytime there's interaction with any of the npcs so to speak it's purpose it has to be purposeful that the dialogue is very stilted and yeah. awful. Well, and you got to consider the film was being filmed in 98 and released in 99. Uh, what fully immersive games did he have to draw upon? That's how a lot of dialogue was in the few PC games that even had extensive dialogue at the time, especially voice dialogue or, or characters where we're in like the proto 3d world. Like I know that one of the influences for this was, a couple years earlier, and I saw it too at the Ontario Science Centre, Sega had put out their VR arcade cabinet that ultimately didn't get into production where you'd walk into this like cage, they close it around you, and you could walk on this trackpad that could move in all different directions, and you put a VR headset on, and, like sort of like you do now with like an Oculus Quest, but it would allow you to walk anywhere, and it was a very simplistic game where you're in a first person perspective, everything's very simple geometric shapes and you've got a gun in your hand and you're blowing up things that are coming at you. And it blew my mind as a kid. And uh, I heard that that was one of the things he saw and he's like, oh, that's interesting. Well, you know, that was so proto. Now there's so much more you could do with somebody, you know, with what we see with VR titles anyway. It's like, what would happen if it did hook up to your brain? Like, it's just, I think some of it was the limitation of what he's working with. And now the way, like, you couldn't have done a game like, like the Uncharted series (laughs) 20, you know, two years ago. So it, it sort of was maybe a little ahead of its time that way. And you're right, like, maybe the stilted dialogue was there to make sure that people could, the audience could go, okay, they're still in a game. There was one performance in this that I didn't like because it felt like it was purposefully weird. Like, I would love to know what the actress's direction was, but the actress who played Allegra, I did not like how she was portrayed on screen. And it's nothing to do with how she came across physically or anything. It's the way she spoke and her dialogue and her manner like this. Yeah. I hated her body language and I never criticized an actress like this before, but she sounded so disinterested. But you notice how different she was uh, as we get to the end when they come out of the game or come out in like quotes yeah, how into they, the how, realist world. Or yeah, whatever. where where they they come out and they're all their their natural accents come back from where they really are. Because like I, I remember first time watching him, like Ian Holmes sounded hilariously bad as the Eastern European guy. 
And the first thing he says when they come out of the game is he's like, my accent was so bad I couldn't even tell what I was saying. <laughs> so like they're, they're, there's that and she acts a little different there. But then of course, you know, the real, the twist at the end is they end up killing the game's creator in the real world maybe. Um, and as they leave, you know, a person asks them, hey, let me know, are we still in the game? Yeah, but the, that real world, quote unquote, is pretty clearly not the real world. Yeah, I don't, of how, me, it, yeah. I don't think there's any question. When I was watching it, like within the first kind of 15, 20 minutes, I kind of figured out what the movie yeah. was. I, I'd never seen it before, but I'm like, okay, this is how this movie is going to play out. Overall. I mean, this movie, it does some interesting things. It's got some interesting ideas. Like I said, I do like the idea of bioengineered stuff like this. And for some reason, I remember the marketing really focusing on the two-headed lizard thing and the it's gristle in like three gun. Scenes. Yeah, and, and it's just there for, hi, I'm a fucking well, lizard. Well, the lizard thing was sort of like to let you know that you were in a you game. Where you, yeah. Well, and like I was fully expecting it to sort of show up in the corner at the end of the of the, the movie, but it didn't. And I almost wonder if they maybe should have to sort of like the, the hint is like, oh, well, there's a fantastical creature that can't possibly exist. But it was also hinted that maybe it's not even there and she's seeing it because of the amount of games she's been playing that she's biopotted into to the point where now her dreams are becoming reality. And I, maybe that's what they were trying to show is that there, there may be, there may no longer be a real world for anybody that's used those games extensively enough that they've become fully delusional. But, uh, yeah. Cause there's one line of dialogue that, or there's one scene of dialogue where they're talking, where they're quote unquote back in the real world. And Allegra says to Pykele, it's weird, isn't it? You can never go back. You now have felt something. You've experienced reality differently, and you want well, to come back to this? Yeah, and, and what the only thing that might hint that it, it may be the real world, even though I'm, I'm fully in agreement with you, Aaron, that it's still a game, is the game's creator who was uh, having that side conversation with the other person saying that you know he this is supposedly a game that he made, and he's like, I'm very disturbed by the tone the game took with the very anti, uh, anti game motif. And she's like, why? He's like, because I didn't write that into the game. So either, either he is, you know, in a game that he didn't realize, like he's lost his perception of reality. He doesn't even know that he's in a game anymore. Or it is possible that they've been programmed by the game to kill people in the real world. Yeah, to me, he's just an NPC. He's just a very well-written NPC. Yeah, and and that would make sense. As if you notice, the deeper they went into the game, like the more levels deep, the less connected to reality it seemed, and the more fake it seemed. Mm-hmm. So maybe maybe they're in a in a game, but they're one level in now, which is why it yeah. still seems more realistic. So that's that's why William Defoe is named Gas in that reality, and there is Country Gas Station that he works at. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. And I did like that the dog had guns concealed in its coat, <laughs> which I thought was funny. But anyway, that's that's Existence. Now we fast forward. We're uh, we're gonna skip uh, Spider, which I still haven't seen. But that film star, it's a psychological thriller starring uh, uh, who is it here? Uh, Ray Fiennes and Miranda Richardson, Gabriel Byrne. Probably worth watching sometime. But you know, psychological thriller ain't horror film, so. I think it's about a guy who's who's lost his memory and may or may not be a killer himself. So probably worth watching at some point. But I know that it was uh, didn't do well when it first came out. I think it did like half its budget in theaters. And I remember just seeing it in the bargain bins at, at Blockbuster forever. One win and run. Coming right up, boys. Bye. Hey, Mr. Stahl. Hey, Jared. Come on, Pat. Hey, Tom. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Good ever. Have a good evening. I'm just closing up, fellas. Coffee. I'm sorry, we're we're closed. Oh, I know that. I do know that. Ah, shut up! We don't carry much cash here. 
family man with long-standing ties to this community. Right now, this community is rallying behind him and calling him a hero. Way to go, Tommy. Great, more reporters. You look like reporters. You're the big hero. Really don't like talking about it, sir. You sure took care of those two bad men, Joey. My name is Tom. It's Joey. You tell me. My daughter, where is she? What's going on, Dad? They thought they knew me. Thought I was somebody else. Nothing to worry about, Mrs. Stahl. I've been watching over. I don't know what you want, and I don't really care. You should care about what I want, because what I want might change your life. Why don't you ask Tom and ask him how come he's so good at killing people? Uh, and then we go a few years uh, down the line, and Cronenberg has sort of a renaissance in Hollywood, like sort of unexpectedly. People thought he was sort of winding down his career, and then he has a he signs uh, a contract to adapt a graphic novel that had done fairly well uh, in in the comic book scene, but not a lot of people knew about until he made the film adaptation for A History of Violence. Um, and the movie cost like thirty some odd million, made like sixty million in theaters. Uh, I saw this when I was in high school. Actually, I think it was for a film class. They're like, "Go see a movie and talk about it," and I. Of note, before we get into the plot, this is the final film in the world to get a VHS release. So uh, after this, the only thing that you would get if you got a VHS was like if some indie person made a movie and they wanted to duplicate some tapes. This was the last movie that was a theatrical movie that got a, a VHS. So I know there are people in weird circles that don't even watch the movie that are collectors that just decided to collect. They're like, hey, I've got a sealed copy of History of Violence because it's the last tape ever released. Um, so hmm. a little trivia there. Um, I wouldn't suggest watching it on a VHS because it would look like crap nowadays. <laughs> Try blowing up a 240p video to like a 50-inch TV and it's going to look like garbage. Uh, but this is probably... Would, would you say this is the most conventional film he's ever made? Maybe outside, Ooh. outside as far as basic plot, outside of maybe the racing movie? Yeah, I would I see, argue I see, History of Violence was, is, yeah, that's what we're talking about. Sorry, I yes. got confused for a second. Yeah, this definitely feels like the most mainstream, the most accessible of any of his movies. This is the one I probably enjoyed the most of his modern stuff that I watched and I was genuinely surprised because we talk in a separate uh, kind of Facebook chat uh, when we do the show here, folks. And I think I remember Aaron saying something along the lines that this movie moved a little too slow. And I would disagree only because this movie kept me engaged only because Viggo Mortensen is so good. And Ooh, everybody else yeah. around him is brought up in their uh, performance, like particularly his son. I was a big fan of his uh, kind the of son. Ca- you, you, you mean the uh, the uh, the social network lookalike? <laughs> yeah, like it, it's so weird because there's one scene where he beats the shit out of a bully. And uh, that definitely rung true for me because uh, that was just a scene that I very much connected with from my personal life but hearing uh vigo's character tom constantly say i'm not this guy you're looking for i'm not this guy i'm not this guy i don't know there was something very 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 convincing about it and then for some random reason like to the point of it being unnecessary um there's a couple of random sex scenes in this just because and a full nude scene because it's in the the comic so it's a faithful adaptation but from what I uh, uh, understood, the comic and the screenplay were there was so much there were so many rewrites that Viggo Mortensen had said later in an interview. Cronenberg uh, should have got a screen credit play on that or a screenwriting credit for this because it had changed so drastically. It had Probably, come down. Yeah. <laughs> it, I, I think I think if I remember what was said. It came down from 120 pages to 70, and that's a significant chunk 
to get cut. Well, and it was so, originally supposed to be a uh, Harrison Ford movie. Yeah, because he was off and the I'm, part I'm, of I'm telling Stone. you, he was too old to play that role. Oh, God, yeah. Like, Vigo's a guy, I wish I'd seen him in more stuff. This was probably one of my favorite roles where he's not swinging around a sword, screaming, I'm the well, this, king of Aragorn or whatever. A, as you'll see, like, some of the films that come after this that we're not talking about, what you'll see is a lot of actors that maybe got typecast, one of their first movie roles they do outside of a big project was to do a film with him. So he does this right after wrapping filming on Lord of the Rings trilogy. Okay. So, yeah, I, I thought it was slow. But with that being said, I think History of Violence sums up my general feelings about Cronenberg from, let's say, the mid-80s to... Onward? Yeah, onward. In that the man is clearly an incredibly gifted filmmaker, writer director all that like this movie is amazingly well put together but it just doesn't really do anything for me and i felt like i kind of understood what it was trying to say within i don't know by the time the scene in the diner happens right at the beginning not not right at the beginning but you know like 20 minutes in i'm like okay this is where the film is gonna go and yeah that's exactly where the film goes so yes the acting is great i think Cronenberg is able to draw out performances from his actors and actresses uh, that are amazing, but the story doesn't really do anything. I don't know. It doesn't do anything that's outstanding to me. I know, that's that's the best way I can and, put I, and, and I can get that. This, this was obviously the first time I saw his films theatrically, and it, it was, you know, there's some shocking moments, and they're like, yeah, you're right, like, it, for a mainstream, what you would normally call a mainstream picture, the way it was marketed too, it's you don't normally see a lot of the sex stuff that like they did here. It felt very much like an '80s movie. Like it, mm. it, it felt like something you would have seen like a Brian De Palma film from the early '80s. Yeah, that's actually pretty close, actually. Um, but you know, Vigo plays Tom Stahl, uh, who is small town uh, dude, runs a, a diner. And but the film opens with uh, trying to remember the guy. They're at the played... Schitt's Creek um, Motel. I know yeah. that. <laughs> That's what it looks. Like. Yeah, you're right. Probably is actually. <laughs> I don't think this um, was shot outside of Shelburne, but this was shot because uh, I used to live there and beside or not too far away from the Schitt's Creek place. Actually, um, it was. It says it was shot in Millbrook, uh, Tottenham, and King City. Tottenham, uh, yeah, that's relatively close to Barry, if I'm not mistaken. So it's so. very possible that the one scene might have been. Yeah, um, possible, yeah. Because like, it opens, again, with that slow opening, like you're right, with Stephen McCaddy, uh, who always plays a great villain. Has that, like, one of those, like, real defining stares. Oh, yeah. Uh, which, and, that, and this opening scene is great. Yeah, I thought it was when, cool. And for years, here's the crazy thing. You want to talk about, like, creepy, intense bad guy stares? His wife, for the longest time, was Meg Foster, who also has creepy, like, intense stares. She's from, uh, which we've seen her in, I think she's in Masters of the Universe. <laughs> As, oh, she's evil, yeah, Lynn? She, yes. Yeah, okay. she's got the eyes. The eyes. Yeah. Yes, yes. She has, like, she can have that creepy look if she really wants to. So, there, can, can you imagine going to a party? It's like, oh, uh, Steve and Meg are here, and you're like, oh, God, don't stare them in the face. <laughs> It's going to creep down your soul and terrify you. Um, but he plays a bad guy on the run. You never really know what they're on the run for, except it's oh, they're, quite they're obvious. Murder, they're, it's, they're, they're killers. Yeah, they're just killing they're anybody. Murders. They're killing anybody they can find and stealing whatever they want. Uh, and he's got like this younger guy under his wing. Uh, and you know sort of what you're in for when it's that slow burn, like they're tired. You're like, why are they so tired? Well, they're tired from a night of murdering people. <laughs> and they... they get up to leave the motel and you know what kind of film it's going to be when a girl gets shot you know luckily not on camera um i I feel like younger cronenberg might have just shot her on camera (laughs) but like the idea is they're wiping people out and you just don't know when like you know they're going to appear but when are they going to appear and after they then cronenberg does a, a decent job of establishing the characters afterwards that you're supposed to like in the in how it's like a slice of life kind of 
you know, Americana, we're, we're living a happy life, but there's still some dynamic issues with the families. Everybody's, they're not all one dimensional. Like at least I can say that about the film. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, and you see that there's issues with the son being bullied and, and there's yeah, domestically that they're, they're, they're doing pretty well, except the kids are obviously having some trouble that he doesn't know about. Uh, and then the diner scene happens where they decide to come into the diner and they're going to steal whatever they want, eat whatever they want and murder everybody just because they can't. And uh, Tom breaks into action and, you know, kills the younger uh, assailant, gets stabbed in the foot, then shoots the face off of, <laughs> of the, the bad guy. And he's then become a, a local news hero. But then it airs on like the tri-state area news and it gets to the attention of people across the country. And uh, Ed Harris shows up in a really creepy looking makeup effect they had for his like dead eye. <laughs> um and comes in to sees him and you know asks for coffee and then says all right thank you joey and uh vigo no sells it the first couple times uh and then they they just start slowly harassing his family because you know in their mind they know that he is a guy from philadelphia who used to be with the irish mob and ran away after uh you find out maiming uh ed harris's character who's a made guy so violence ensues uh and the trust of his family is betrayed when when he admits that he you know he isn't who he says he is he's basically been on the run for 25 years and uh the the son ends up having to save the dad by using a double barrel shotgun on ed harris and uh most of the deaths that tom stall inflicts in here are, are like something you'd see steven seagal do <laughs> or something you'd see like john wick do like he's just really good at killing people even mm-hmm. though you wouldn't you wouldn't suspect it and he hasn't done it in, in 20 some odd years so after having uh violent angry sex with his wife on the stairs which michael was referring to uh he decides to go and he's like they're gonna keep coming after me and my family so he decides to go settle the score uh up in philadelphia where you find you find out his brother older brother is actually a captain in the mob and craziness ensues and he has to kill his brother and basically that section so like the only people that would know who he is he has to kill them and leave no trace and then it ends with him coming back home and having dinner uh with his family his little daughter has no idea what's happening so she gets him a plate and they just sort of sit unsettled at the table knowing that they have a very difficult future ahead of them if the mob's not coming after them just the idea of the betrayal of his past is enough that it's going to be a weird next few years for sure Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> I mean, this is the one I enjoyed the most. And I don't know, maybe I was just in the right frame of mind when I saw it, but really enjoyed Vigo. I love the story of you try to run away from your past, your past eventually catches up to you. And despite um, Ed Harris only being in this for not very probably, long, all things. Probably 25 minutes total, maybe. Yeah, he's a great bad guy when he gets something to chew on. The first movie I ever saw Ed Harrison was, I think, Apollo 13, where he played Gene, who was, I think, uh, Capcom at that time. Yeah, Gene Prance, yeah. Yeah, uh, wonderful performance, great guy. And then I saw him again in The Rock, where he played uh, General Hummel. And just seeing him play bad guy roles, I really, because he has that very intense voice but it's that i'm going to be nice with you i'm going to be polite with you but i'm gonna tell you if you fuck with me they'll never find the body <laughs> and i love that intensity about um ed harris I and mean, even with vigo mortensen i really get the sense that he loves his family he wants to protect them but as is said in many a Liam Neeson movie, I have a very particular set of skills, and I get that vibe from this. So, well, sort of like Ed, a proto taken in a weird. Like way. my first Ed Harris experience was probably seeing him in The Abyss, um, which I still and, have never seen. Oh boy, mm, that wow. one, that one's worth it. Um, there's a few others he did from that time period. I for a second I I know it's The Abyss, but I thought he was in Leviathan, but that's a different movie, but basically the same thing, uh, which we'll have to look at sometime. But uh, there's a line in the film. Was it, I think, from <clears throat> from William Hurt, the, who plays the older brother? He says to him, "When you dream, do you still dream? As, do you dream as Tom, or do you dream as Joey?" 
like because he's been away from the life for so long and pretending to be somebody else so long that does he even in a subconscious is, is who is, he is sort of thing yeah are are you the same person like are or are you this new guy um so that, that that's one of the more decent lines and I, I feel like there's a few lines in this film that like somebody must have brought like Cronenberg wouldn't have just taken a graphic novel unless I'm assuming like his his son and daughter are like roughly our age somewhere in between there um like between like 34 and 40 so I'm wondering if 15 years ago it was a case of like his son or daughter had the graphic novel and he's like what are you reading and flipped through it and went what this is pretty good because this is also right around the time that graphic novels started to blow up like road to perdition had just come out i think a year earlier so that this before all the comic book craze where it was all the superheroes it was all about this graphic novel like oh oh my god because the storyboards are basically done for you they're already right on the page um yeah and there's a couple moments in there that you know again are, are well made um but it is, I can see, it's a slower movie. Like, it's a movie that's 96 minutes long, but could probably have worked at 75 minutes even. Oh, sure, sure, yeah. Um, but, I, I, again... All the performances I, are great, though. That's the thing. Oh, like, oh yeah. And and there's there's people in here that, um, again, pop up in a lot of other Cronenberg films. This was Vigo's first film with them. After this, he ended up doing, I think, two or three more, and then he's got the new one out coming soon. And uh, Peter McNeil, who, who played the... Uh, stunt driver in Crash is in this as the sheriff. Uh, I'm trying to think. There might be a few other people that showed up that were like supporting actors. Uh, but again, probably the smallest picture he made uh, when it comes to sets and the amount of things going on because the closest thing to this maybe would have been the dead the gun zone. fights, really, yeah. Like, oh, no, the, sorry. Yeah, in, in terms of small and scale, yeah, I'd say dead zone. Um, you could probably make... A case for dead ringers, but I guess for the special rabid. effects, yeah, rabbit. Yeah, but I mean, as far as this one had so little, like the special effects are just a couple of the violent scenes, and everything else mm-hmm. is all shot, sort of natural lighting, and and uh, it, it's interesting. And I, the whole oh, not movie, rabbit. I'm sorry, I meant shiver. Like the, the oh yeah the yeah, yeah the first the apartment yeah. complex. Yeah, because in this, it's basically his home, uh, the diner. And the school, and that's pretty much everything, other than the establishing shot of the, the motel and the and the final scene. So it's like five sets, which is almost nothing when you consider, you know, how many sets we have for movies nowadays. So, I mean, it's cool. Uh, it's probably. Would you say this is like one of the more accessible ways to jump into his films if you're unsure? I don't think it's representative of what Cronenberg is, because let's face it, this guy's signature is fucked up. Um, and, but I don't know, this would be a good movie just to show anybody. And then if you happen to find out it's a Cronenberg, I think it's a pleasant surprise. Like I think his stuff in the two thousands, cause we're going to talk about Eastern promises next that I think these two are the most accessible that aren't like, here's fucked up horror movies. Like if I were to go, like, we'll talk about this at the end of the show, going through all the kind of decades and like everything. I think history of violence has that ability. You can show it to almost anybody and they'll probably enjoy it. Eastern promises has a good enough rooted story that you'll get people involved without saying, Hey, you know, what's awesome. People shooting each other with chicken guns and fucking in violent car crashes. <laughs> By the way, Ultron fucks Casey Jones. You know what I mean? Like you can do Cronenberg doesn't need weird to be good. And I wish he would do more movies that, don't necessarily lean into this is so bizarre you need to really think about it. I mean, that's great and wonderful on one hand, but by doing something a little more mainstreamy, I think you'll bring more people yeah, into you. Like this this has audience score on Rotten Tomatoes is seventy six percent. Uh the tomato score is eighty seven percent of critics liked it. Mm-hmm. So I, I can see that. Um Looking at the previous ones that we saw today, specifically, uh, Crash has 63 pretty much across the board, um, and Existence has 74%. So I guess the critics that did watch them like them. Uh, Spider has 85, so we will probably have to watch that sometime. We think he might be Russian Mafia. And he was a member of Vodev Sakonia. In Russian prisons, your life story is written on your body in tattoos. You don't have tattoos, you don't exist. 
I'm afraid we've lost the mother. An identified woman died December the 20th, 2313. Baby girl born 20th of December, 2314. Anya, where did you get this? I found it in the handbag of the girl who died in my ward. I should bury her secrets with her body. I'm a midwife. I was hoping to speak to the manager. Yeah, and I'm so sorry if she had worked here. I would remember it is said. It's all right. I'll probably find out more once I get her diary translated. A diary? You want to go for a drink? It's Christmas. Everything's closed. Sometimes, if things are closed, you just open them up. This girl ended up in the hands of the Vori Fasakonyi. Do you know what that means? How did you get in here? There are always open doors. He wants the diary. My son, Kirillos. Mentioned many a times. I think he was threatening to harm the baby. If the diary should find its way to the police. Okay, boss, you don't have to worry. Police won't find any. She was 14, just just a child. Forget any of this ever happened. Stay away from people like me. But you read the diary. How can you keep doing what you're doing? I decide what's right and what's wrong. You can't afford to be killed in any area. I need to know who you are. Show some respect. This is respect. I guess moving on, after this film, I, we had to wait a year or two till we got his next picture, which I believe to date is still his highest budgeted picture. Uh, and that was Eastern Promises. And I believe it was his first film actually filmed outside of uh, either a uh, couple times he filmed in the states but for the most part it was montreal or toronto this act was actually filmed overseas in uh parts of london um yeah. and this was the one that like i purposely picked this one to end on because i had a feeling that if aaron didn't care for the other ones this might be the one that hits all the check boxes <laughs> see and i i did enjoy this movie um I, you know it doesn't hit my boxes for like you know good science fiction or, or anything like that but it's a but good for, movie. For, for, it's a but, good. But, it's a very good movie. Just like you know our previous movies, that that it's it's very competently put together. But the the difference between this and let's say a history of violence is that in Eastern Promises there are actual like characters that you can latch onto and care about that are honestly just good people, truly good there's people, anti heroes, <laughs> and then there's you know villains There's, and, and, and different Viggo Mortensen and, plays an anti-hero in it and, and that's and, that's fine and different levels of villain there are villains that are villains based on circumstance and upbringing and then there's villains yes. that are truly evil and you had said that there was uh subtitles that you, you should turn on and off or whatever for yeah. us and i actually as little russian as i speak but i do speak some I could actually follow the conversations just fine with wasn't too subtitles. bad. Okay, because yeah, like yeah. The, the the subtitles on the the release are weird. They default to having all English, but if you switch it to the other subtitle track, it would make it so that only when the Russian is spoken. What's What's funny is is that the the vast majority of the dialogue um, is very simple Russian. Like they're just having conversations about like what you know is the food good? How are you feeling today? Yeah, you know, or, or or what the hell? Why'd you hit me? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, or it's cursing, and I understand yeah. all of that. That's <laughs> that's fine. Why am I not surprised? <laughs> yeah, it's it's the cursing. Um, but I mean, if you watch enough Russian dash cam, you know, crashes, you can kind of pick up the 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 cursing anyway. Um, but yeah, this this movie was fantastic uh, to me. But that's yeah. mainly because I got a lot of the cultural references, and I could taste all the food that was in that restaurant in that uh, in one of the earlier scenes. And it just made me crave borscht again. I need to make my grandmother's <laughs> recipe of borscht. It has more life and color than most of his films. Yes. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure if this is... Like, he didn't write this, the screenplay for this. I'm not even sure if it's based on a book. But I do remember seeing it in theaters. And every other Cronenberg film I've seen in theaters has been... Even History of Violence has a few people on there. Maybe like half. The theater was packed for this one. And I feel it was maybe because it was coming off the rails of a lot of uh, high concept, high big budget uh, crime movies and, and mob movies that were coming out around this time. Like you had The Departed uh, from Martin Scorsese and a few others. Uh, and and just like a renewed interest in, in the crime movie. And how many mob movies at the time had focused 
on the Russian mob. Very few. Uh, I was about to say, yeah, that's one thing that you absolutely nailed. You don't see too many movies about the ethnic mafia that aren't, you know, the uh, the Italian. Italian then Italians are getting are, well. These Italians are, the are Irish. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The but, but so yeah, like I in in the many years that I've been watching crime movies, I've seen the Italian mafia more often than not. I've seen Russian. I've seen Irish. Irish was in Boondock Saints, if I'm not mistaken yeah and the departed and the, like, and the departed if if it's if it's an american movie and it takes place in boston or chicago it's usually the irish mob mm-hmm. um unless it's like early 30s then it'll be italian mob in in chicago but it's you very rarely see anything but those two in western movies i was about to say yeah because there are crime cartels and other crime families that are regional specific like there's the chinese triads there's the japanese yakuza stuff like that there's even i think ethnic mafias uh or ethnic crime syndicates from like uh africa i think there, and obviously well, we know about the cartels from well, South there's America like, and whatnot. and there's, there's stuff like albanians and everything too but mm-hmm. but uh, as uh, Aaron alluded to uh, Savori. Like, do you have a little bit more background for us? How is that different yeah. from like the basic Russian mafia? Well, the Vori are kind of stemmed out of, and, and, and I'm probably going to be wrong. And I'm sorry if anybody's more knowledgeable out there than I am on it, because you know I'm not I'm not an expert. But the Vori kind of stemmed compared from to us, Soviet, compared to us, we don't really know. <laughs> it, it stemmed from Soviet prison culture, okay. and uh, that's why a lot of the Vori that you see in this movie have these prison tattoos because a lot of their um, their crimes or their big life uh, events, they kind of tattoo in different ways on their body. So, so you know, if you kill somebody, you get a tattoo about it. So it's closer you. to almost like, like the in the states, like Hispanic crime. Like you see, like gangs that have they go to prison, and they get like a a, a tear tattooed or something. It's yeah, but it's that. much more ornate and detailed with with the Vori. I mean, if if you look. During this movie, you know, when they, they find the body that, that Viggo Mortensen, like, disassembled, there's yeah. prison tattoos, there's these Vori tattoos, and the people can clearly see that this person was Vori based on these tattoos, and that even though there's absolutely no identifiable features left on the body, they could probably get a full life story of this guy. Yeah, even without DNA, they could tell where the guy was and track him down. Yeah. So yeah, it stems it stems from Soviet prison culture. Um, there's a lot of like religious iconic uh, iconograph, uh, yeah, I- icons. Yeah, in it. he's got the cross. Um, he's got uh, churches put on him, and and the, each it has like a dual meaning for each one. It's like that. It could be like the patron saint of this also deals with. Oh, that's a person who who never ever opened his mouth to you know he 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 kept his his convictions. So that also means that he was somebody who could not be broken when they were interrogating him, that sort of thing. There was something else that I read while I was reading the Wikipedia on this. Cause I, there were parts of this movie. That I was a little lost in following, um, but they talk, uh, Vigo talks about his tattoos. Um, it turns out he wouldn't leave the set until they were washed off just in case somebody saw him. Because well, he, he apparently he he one time wore them to a, a the pub right after, and people were staring at him terrified. Yeah, yeah because like, they understood wow. like he went to a Russian bar or something like that, and he, yeah, they understood what the tattoos meant. And he he, and, he thought it, he thought it'd be funny, and then he said he only ever did it once because it was so terrifying afterwards. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, if you had the tattoos that that his character would have, holy crap! I that's mean, a big target on you. Well, it's not just a big target. It's that, you know, well, it's somebody could come up to him and be like, we, we see your tattoos, but we don't know your name and your face. Why do you have those tattoos and who are you? And, and yeah, why are you impersonating us? Yeah, it's it's dangerous. It's dangerous. So, I mean, uh, it's always kind of funny because sometimes Hollywood, I wouldn't say glamorizes, but more or less it does it shows a different side of crime because i remember even kind of growing up even before i I saw goodfellas and there's that famous line i always wanted to be a gangster right and people don't realize that you know that's a fairly dangerous world i mean even doing something as simple as dealing weed or coke or whatever we 
you watch shows like um, Drugs, Inc. and whatnot, where they talk about people who are in the Russian mafia, talk about all these ethnic gangs and everything. You see how dangerous this world is. And I remember, like, the, like I, I know for m- many years, the guy who did Goodfellas, the guy who, who had his like, life story based on it and turned into the movie... He got kicked out of witness protection because he wouldn't shut the fuck up. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you think about, you know, with once again, like, as you said, when Vigo went to this pub and people were like, oh, my God, what if some rando who doesn't know what he's doing thinks, hey, that guy's a pr- that, that guy's got all these tats. What if I take him out and make a name for or, myself or worse comes yeah. up to him thinking he's somebody he should be meeting with? And then starts trying to do business with him before finding out he's not. Mm -hmm. Because then he's now potentially leaked information to him and he's got to kill him. (laughs) Yeah. And it's also a sign of, you know, respect. We're like, oh, you think it's funny to portray us in your make believe movie sort of thing? You've seen people in the States. You've heard all these stories about people think it's cool to get like gang affiliated tattoos and then they end up in the wrong neighborhood and they get called out and they're like, Okay, who jumped into the gang? And if you don't have a proper answer, they'll kick the crap out of you. Or kill you. Yeah. yeah so, I like, mean, I, I, I get it. Like, and it's revealed throughout, you know, spoilers, uh, that he's actually uh, an FSB agent working undercover to try to uh, get in with the local mob in London to see what their connection is back at Moscow. Um, but he's in so deep that he's having to do things that he shouldn't do, like dispose of bodies by processing them, by like cutting their fingers off and how, how relaxed he is while doing it is pretty disturbing. Uh, but then he does things like he's sending notes back to his, his British Scotland yard uh, handler by like stuffing a note inside the body's cadaver for them to find. Uh, and purposely using like, he, when he tells uh, Kirill, he's like, this is the best place to dispose of bodies. It's not the best place. It's the place he knows will wash up on shore the fastest before the body gets taken out to sea. So it's he's he is working both sides to try to do that. Uh, interesting enough, like I, I always find it funny when you get actors like, okay, Viggo Mortensen, you got an American actor uh, putting on a Russian accent to play a Russian, but you have his, his captain, uh, played by Vincent Cassell, well, he's a French actor pretending to be Russian, and his father in it is Armin Mueller Stahl, a German actor who really isn't even trying to hide his German accent when speaking Russian. <laughs> Which is so weird. The first movie I saw that guy in was the X Files Fight the Future movie from like ninety six or ninety nine, something like that. And I'm about to say, I'm pretty sure you're not Russian, dude. Um, but he you, he's a yeah. great actor. It's just very strange i don't and, i don't and think the, there's any russian actors in this actually i don't think um, so because maybe, the guy that plays kirill is the dude from oceans 12 who's the french thief yeah even the uncle stepan is from poland <laughs> um let me see here anybody I should, I should say there's no russian or ukrainian actors in this at the very least i don't even know if there's any belarusian I was actually going to ask you this, Aaron, and I hope this doesn't come across as offensive. Who are the most famous Russian actors in Hollywood right now? Oh, my God. I don't know if I can answer that. In, yeah, because I really is, don't know. Is that actor Chucky Cario? Is he Russian? Or he's probably from Turkey or something like that. Um, Russia Russian? I'm sure that there's a few, and we're just not thinking of them at the immediate moment. But Yeah, because there's yeah. got to be one where, like, oh, he's from you know moscow well, I mean, or something if, if you want to get super technical about it you could probably stay say steven seagal because he he, he became <laughs> russian oh because they, they'll, but, let him, they'll let him pretend that he can still beat people up yeah yeah so i mean if you wanted to get really technical about that but no um him and his giant oh carrot. god i literally typed in famous russian actors and here they list a list on, on uh google and it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The ninth picture in is Steven Seagal. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just looking to see if there's any other names I recognize. Uh, I think it's because they sort of have their own market. Like, I know we've had Russian directors that have moved over to Hollywood, but it must be hard for them to leave their market. 
maybe well, if we I mean, were there, there is a there's there's a large enough language you know isolation so to speak um between the two cultures that it's you know it is kind of tough to breach that gap in a it's, lot of ways it's mostly character actors i don't th- i don't see a lot of leading actors that have made it okay and or or you see a lot of like um yugoslavian croatian you see a lot of people from the former ussr but not not russia as a whole you know i can anton think yelchin. of a lot of like anton yelchin girls was, yeah was yeah russian. yeah yeah and i was gonna say there and and looking at this this film yeah you're right it, it's sort of people from all these other countries that are pretending to be russian and even like the narrator for tatiana the 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 uh the diary's voice is uh, one of her first roles is Tatiana Maslany, who is now sort of exploded. The Canadian actress, um, she was the star of, um, uh, was it called? Oh, it was on for a few years and it got a bunch of awards. Uh, uh, Orphan Black. And she just did something else theatrically that was like a, a big picture and, and got nominated for an Oscar or something too. So there are people that got their start in this film. Uh, Naomi Watts uh, was great as, as you said, as one of the only truly good characters, <laughs> who who has nothing like you, you. You're watching this movie, going, "I please don't let anything happen to her." <laughs> oh yeah, all the way through it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and with Vincent Cassell being sort of unhinged, his character is clearly though he he has bad tendencies, but it's it's mostly like he's got Arrested Development because he's been so abused by his family upbringing. Because you'll see moments where he's like, I'm assuming with his own, like it's never explicitly shown that the the girls are his girls or maybe they're his nieces when he's at the birthday parties and that. Um, it's obviously hinted that he has a thing for Vigo's character. Like it's, it's there's some deep, deep undertones and overtones, yeah. um, and and that Vigo knows this and that's how he's going to control him. Um, and but then you see Armin Mueller Stahl and you see somebody who is a truly bad person. Um, and then same with, uh, there was, who was the, 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 I forget the character's name, but the barbershop owner and his, his, um, his handicap or whatever his name was. Yeah. And his handicapped, uh, nephew who he gets to perform the murders, which like for an opening scene for a movie, that's pretty, it's like, wow, that was a very Martin Scorsese esque effect, I think for it. Um, then like it, it strays a bit from the, like Scorsese's Coppola style of uh, gangster film in that it does focus more on like it's 50 50 it's 50 with Mortensen and 50 with Naomi Watts's character and you realize like her family like her mom's good but like the, the uncle talk about a character yeah he, he's he's an he, interesting character like he's clearly racist right but he, he, he means well for her but he says things because he's either from that generation or how he's grew how he grew up like some of the lines he says there i'm like oh my god and i remember seeing in theaters seeing that like where's your boyfriend why is he not here and he's like well black men always run away and and yeah holy crap yeah yeah yeah. oh oh, yeah and then there's that 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 dialogue he has with her he's like and he just sips his 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 vodka and next line out of his mouth like at at their thanksgiving dinner is it's either thanksgiving or christmas dinner or something like that he is well and that's that's why your your baby died inside you it's not good to mix blood yeah yeah oh, that was the most shocking one yeah it's like yikes yeah and he's like what what she needs to hear the truth and he's <laughs> they kick him out for the day but, but then again he's not like this horrible evil person because right after that he starts to translate the diary and he's like you need to stop and you need to burn the book and get rid of it and never and forget it even existed because he's yeah because he, you're he, in danger now he, yeah. he knows the people involved and like he always talked about how he, he used to be an fsb agent and all this like and they always took that as like oh he's he's pretending he's boasting he used to be kgb he's like yeah yeah i'm gonna step on you're full of shit and then you know vigo was told to kill him because they re- because they realized he's the one that translated the book and he, instead, that's when you realize that he's not a Vigo's not a bad guy. Before he, it's revealed that he's a, an undercover agent. Instead of killing him, he sends him away to I think it's Scotland, uh, or, or like he sends him up north. You know, don't tell anybody. And when he tells her, she's like, "I need to know what happened to my uncle." He's like, "He's up there." He goes, "He's old school. He understands." So mm-hmm. like he like he paid him a visit, and like you could tell he didn't even have to really convince him much. He's just like, "You need to go." 
and here's where you're going and don't come back for a while. So uh, there's more that happens. I was fascinated by how the, like we've seen initiations into the, the Italian mob, the, the idea in movies, like they, they prick their finger and there's like a blood oath and all that sort of stuff. And this is different. Like they dress you down. They see, they check your reactions. They want to make you like a blank slate. And then they, if they determine you're in, that's when they give you your tattoo. And once you, once you're tattooed, you're in, like you're not out. But the whole reason for this is as a ploy to get him to be killed as a uh, as a proxy for uh, an a patsy for for Kirill's mistakes. Um, but you know, obviously, he survives, and and we get probably the most harrowing thing I've seen in a movie ever, which is the which is when they realize that Kirill has been sent to kill the baby. Yeah, that was a surprisingly intense scene where that actor is like i don't want to do this baby like you did nothing wrong i'm sorry please forgive well, me and that's you can see like, and that's where it's revealed that it's clear like he as bad of a character as he is he's not a truly evil person yeah he's not a because monster he's, he, he's down there at the do- at the beach or at the the water where he had seen before that's where he was told is the best way to kill someone and he's crying because he he's having so he's even getting like muscle contractions because he can't bring himself to kill the baby but then mm-hmm. he, he but then he thinks he has to and you know and, and normally vigo nobody would say anything against him but he says your father's gone too far we don't kill babies and like you kill people whatever you don't kill babies and then then you that's and he gives him the ultimatum it's your father or me and that's his in that's how he's going like from the shadows he's technically going to control the family and also direct them towards uh you know eventually i guess getting shut down by the the fsb and by scott or at least you know controlled yeah yeah the the idea is maybe maybe keep it open like have he he won't be the guy technically in charge but it's quite clear he has full control over the family yeah and it it ends it actually ends on mostly a happy note when you consider it like and and you want to talk about characters as well just sort of finishing this out is armin Mueller stahl's character like you can see where the dynamic is why his relationship with, with kirill is so bad it's because it's kirill is obviously gay or bisexual but how many times in the movie does armin Mueller stahl's character constantly talk about how he doesn't trust the, the blacks and the queers and all this stuff um, so it, it's it's clear that he could never come out to his dad or his dad would just kick the shit out of him and in fact all this craziness that happens is all simply because like even the the diary might not have happened the same way all this happens because the character at the beginning of the film that gets murdered in the barbershop um made an off comment that he called he called uh vincent cassell's character queer so he's murdered for that and that's what sets all this chain of of events in motion so it's very it's even like the the italian mob that way very close circuit very uber macho you don't like mess with our pride you don't mess with you know who we are yada 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 uh and i i did like that it was a fascinating look at at how that culture is i love the scene where they're doing the birthday party for the 100 year old lady oh yeah they're singing and bringing out all the food and how much color it is and how they all seemed happy and and all this and then in the meantime they're also doing all these back back street dirty deals at the same time Mm -hmm. Uh, one thing i think this movie did really well it set a great atmosphere up like it set a believable world that was filled with tension and danger from all different sides and i don't know that there's a lot to like about this movie more so than i thought and i i thought the bathhouse scene was particularly intense. oh I, I forgot how could we forget the most like i was sitting in theaters remember a full house i'm probably one of the youngest people there i'm 20 it's me and a couple friends, and then all these people in their forties, fifties, and sixties watching the movie. The audible gasps at the like because you're sitting there and you're like, "Oh, they're naked. Oh, they're gonna like do some some sort of shot where they covert like sh- maybe in the shadows." Nope, fully naked fight scene, full dick waggling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did, how many points did that get? Is that one point or is that? <laughs> uh, male full full male nudity is makes the scene automatically two points just because you don't. <laughs> We rarely, rarely see that. So how? Yeah, let alone a five-minute extended fight scene. Yeah, it's still two. <laughs> and and again, that's it's it's brutal because like you want to talk about 
daring and all, there's not much they could hide. And, and he, he had to do that scene. And I, I can only imagine that for quite some time after filming that, like, could you imagine he, he probably went to the premiere and he's sitting there and he's like, all right, cover my eyes. What are, what are people saying? Like, I will bet you that there were audible gasps at can even when it happened. Cause leading actors don't do that. Yeah. Period. Like, or if they do, it's like Harvey Keitel in one or two scenes where it's like, it's on camera for a second. Like, this this was he's fully naked and his balls are out and they're having a fight with knives. What are those knives called again? They're linoleum knives. Those are linoleum cutters knives. Yeah, and just that was it was it was surprising. And I'm like, how did that not get an NC-17 in the states? And I wonder if maybe it had a scene cut or something. Maybe um, it's because male nudity when it's not in a sexual context is kind of the same as female nudity when it's not in a, in a sexual context they, they, it's they, not going to get like it. an nc-17 it'll be r but it won't be nc-17 <laughs> maybe he should feel offended because maybe he wasn't much of a hanger <laughs> he no i mean as long i mean the the, the rules are, are weird i think it's as long as the man is not erect but you, 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 you say it. that but but if he was if he had like a seven inch hanging down in front of him it probably would have <laughs> it probably would have been different it's if he was a, a shower yeah. yeah, big big shower more than anything, uh, because I mean, the, even in like the Suicide Squad movie, there's a full male nudity scene, but that's only like one second. Yeah, there's one in what twenty eight days later, technically. Yeah, I, I just I think this is this might be in a mainstream movie the, the longest extended scene I've ever seen. It's probably the only fight scene because think of the last time I saw a bathhouse fight scene in a movie was John in... Wick. No, uh, oh maybe that, but that came after. Um, yeah, but no, I'm thinking. Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, versus Sven Thorson in uh, uh, Red Heat, the opening scene. They're in a, a Russian bathhouse and they fight. And somehow those towels never come off. <laughs> They're fighting and kicking each other through the snow and out, out the building. Nothing happens. But I guess that's the difference between 1988 and 2007. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, other than that, it's, again, a film that doesn't feel like a Cronenberg movie at all. And I, I don't know. I loved it just because. I mean, maybe, it's maybe yeah. the maybe maybe the fact that he went with the the male nude fight might be the only thing that would make you go, okay, that's Cronenberg. But nothing else here, like even the gore that's in it, the violence. There's nothing in this that is like typical of his, like focusing on a gory scene. The violence happens, and it's realistic. Yeah, I'd say that's a pretty good assessment of it. I think the real horror is about killing the baby. Like yeah. the, just the it's the buildup yeah. that you know that somebody's going to try to kill the baby, killing the baby and the the sex slaves. Yeah, and how he, that was he, pretty horrific. Yeah, like he's he's forced to have sex with a girl who's been drugged up on heroin, just forced to do it to prove his loyalty. But in reality, it's because Kirill wants to see him naked. Um, and, but you find out at the end that he found out her name and he got her out. How how a lot of this happened was they. Kareel mentions he's like, "What? Can you believe what happened? I don't know how this happened." They busted up the uh, the the whorehouse, and she got back to her home. So he did get her out, even though like he was forced he was forced to partake, but he got them to all get home. And that's sort of it's said in the background, but you don't like see it happen. It's just it's so it's like that's another thing where it's like, okay, so he is a good guy, but again, he's like if he's not going to do it, if if he gets caught or gets killed, who's going to be able to work their way in again to actually get these people out? So he has to keep going. Yep. He, he and, Yeah, he's the right man in the right place at the right time. Yeah. So, again, very multi-layered. Nobody's, like, nobody is just, you know, one-dimensional. Everybody has depth, every single character in this. So uh, I, I'd say this is, again, you don't have to be a big fan of his work. This is a film that anybody can watch as long as you're okay with some of the subject matter. Um, Naomi Watts puts in a good performance. They all do. And um, I, I was pretty happy overall with how everything turned out. And then after this, we skipped uh, his later films because we don't have time before Halloween. And also, like, I'll give you just a brief rundown of what they are. Right after this film, uh, he took three years off and then ended up filming A Dangerous Method with Viggo Mortensen, uh, Kara Knightley, and Michael Fassbender. And Vincent Cassell came back as well. And it is about the start of the talking cure, the talking method of uh, psychoanalysis and love triangle type stuff with uh, Michael Fassbender's Carl Jung becoming embroiled in a sex scandal with uh, Kira Knightley, uh, who is one of his Russian patients. Mm. 
Uh, good movie. Very has a hilariously bad piece of CGI when they show like their boat coming overseas. It was really bad CGI. Um, probably because the film's budget was like a third of what this previous film was. Uh, but it's worth watching. It's just a normal drama. Um, again, not very Cronenbergian. Uh, then after that, he did Cosmopolis, which is the most Cronenberg film I've seen in a very long time. Uh, this stars Robert Pattinson in his first big role outside of doing the Twilight movies. And he did that movie on purpose because he was so pissed off at being typecast as the teen vampire. And it's him, Paul Giamatti, uh, Juliette Binoche, and a bunch of other actors that you'd see as character actors. Uh, the, almost the entire film takes place in a limousine that he's in as the world is ending around him, but he doesn't realize it. And just weird Cronenbergian type things happen to him while he's in there. Um, worth a watch. Very weird. I saw it in theaters and I ended up getting my money back because uh, some guy was th- had like a fit, like through, had like a had like a meltdown while watching it. Like, wow. Sc- yeah. Like there, it turns out s- there was somebody who was actually, he was out to go see a movie, but he was out from like the actual mental health hospital we have here. Okay. And he, he, he just had like a complete breakdown halfway through the movie and they had to stop the movie and escort him out. And he went back to the hospital and I was like, what, why didn't they let him go see like a kid's movie? Like he was somebody who was an inpatient that was out for the day. And, after they came and talked to us, we all ended up getting like extra free tickets and stuff because it, I'll talk about it off air with you guys sometime, but it was, it was strange what was happening while watching the film. And I almost feel like, was it Cronenberg's film doing it to him? Um, wow. So that one, I ended up having to watch a second time on video when it came out. Uh, and then his last film released in theaters was uh, in 2014 maps to the stars, which is, I think based on another book. Um, and that film is about, weird people living in the Hollywood system, um, what it does to kid actors and, and some people are murderers and some people, it's just like a murder mystery weirdness. Uh, Julianne Moore, um, who's in it else is in it? John Cusack, Olivia Williams, Robert Pattinson's back again. Uh, and a bunch of other character actors pop up throughout it. Uh, Carrie Fisher appears as herself. I remember that. That was weird. Uh, and that one's, uh, again, another low-budget affair. And people thought that uh, he was just sort of going to retire after that because it was just a, another sort of artsy film he liked based on a book. And then flash forward to last year, and he's like, I'm going to make a movie. <laughs> and I think he's also, this year, starring in the season four of Slasher, the TV show. He plays the patriarch of a family on an island who is going to... he's brought them all to the island to talk to them about how he's going to divvy up his wealth once he's dead and then people start getting murdered so it's classic slasher type story um and then obviously he's in uh star trek he's actually going to be in this new season of uh discovery again apparently yeah Um, he was the best part of season three and he's going to be in season four so he's more active in the last two to three years than he's been in 10 years or more so that sort of brings you up to date in what we saw. I, that's, and you can sort of see why I picked the ones I picked. Uh, do you guys have any closing thoughts on like how each decade is sort of different or how his film sort of, he has like, in my mind, he has sort of an ebb and flow of the kind of films he makes. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, I like him when he does horror movies. I think my favorites, if I had to rank my Cronenberg movies in terms of my favorites, like pick I'd three that you, that you'd like the dead zone. Uh, scanners and Videodrome would probably be my top. For three. yours, yes. And honorable mention would go to History of Violence. Okay, so in your case, you like the three movies he made from 1981 to 1983. Hmm. Um, for me, before Aaron goes, I think mine would be um, after rewatching Scanners and Videodrome. I like them, but not the same as I used to. I would say mine would be The Dead Zone. Um, the Dead Zone, Eastern Promises, and we could flip anywhere between. Um, maybe Existence. Wow. I sort of like I I like one from each decade, if that makes any sense. Maybe. Um, uh, okay. Yeah, and that's. And again, that might change, but for the top two for me are Eastern Promises and The Dead Zone. 
I would say my top is easily Eastern Promises, and then uh, Shivers and Rabid. Okay. Um. Yeah, everything kind of in between there. Like I liked Scanners, but it's not in my top three. Um. Yeah, the 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 early stuff and then Eastern Promises. That just those are the ones that really stood out to me as the ones I I enjoyed the most. And so basically, there's a 30 year gap where you didn't care for a lot of his stuff. Yeah, I mean, right after right after Rabbit, I mean, you have the Brood and Videodrome. I mean, Scanners breaks that up, and both of those movies, I just had to turn off. Like, <laughs> I, I just, I'm done. I can't. Yeah. I can't do it anymore. I know we didn't watch uh, the Dead Zone for this, but we did briefly talk about. It. Have you seen that film? I have. Yeah, that one, it, it, I as much as I like it, he didn't write or produce it, so it might not count as a Cronenberg film, except that it's right in that era when Stephen King books were getting pretty decent adaptations. Yeah, um, and I mean, I, as far as I remember, like, we didn't watch it for this, obviously. We, you already said that, but yeah. from what I remember, I thought it was okay. Um, I probably haven't yeah. seen it in 20 years. It, it, it would be I, worth I've already said that a... I hated the fly so well th- yeah this is there's no gore in this film at all so it, it's it did something right in that it was so well uh appreciated and liked that when they did do the adaptation for i think it was the usa network had the tv show i don't think it was the sci-fi channel maybe it was at the end but they did i think six seasons with anthony michael hall as the uh, the titular character uh, they did bring back Tom Skerritt for that. Um, and there were some parts that, that sort of tied it loosely together. Um, I know that for a long time, it was one of the only Stephen King adaptations that Stephen King himself actually liked. I know he notoriously didn't like uh, The Shining, which is hilarious, because when he made his own version, it was terrible. <laughs> um, and was, I think in Maximum Overdrive, though, he liked that, it, but he didn't really remember it. Was, yeah, yeah, it was coked out of his mind. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I know he didn't care for Christine either. Um, I think the only ones he liked of the of that era that are considered classics to everybody else as well was the Dead Zone and Carrie. I th- I think he liked Pet Cemetery, but I'm not a hundred percent sure on that. Yeah, like there, there were so many of his adaptations that didn't really hit. But I I think one of the reasons why I like the Dead Zone is not just the concept, but it's the first film where we saw. Christopher Walken talk with his iconic Walken voice. If you look at any film previous, including like the the Deer Hunter, where he was his breakout role, he talked like a regular actor. This is the film where he had his distinctive cadence to everything, uh, and it sort of it hit me on all levels in that it, it's not as slow as some of his other films, and it also has more plot that seems to happen in it like more things happen there's more memorable lines from that film so i mean that's for me as far as if you want to get into cronenberg's films um a good jumping in point is probably rabbit if you want to see like a true cronenberg style film yeah or I mean, I thought rabbit was great try rabbit uh and don't if you're looking up rabbit don't go with the soska sisters version <laughs> that came out a couple years ago um with cm because, punk right yeah cm who else is <laughs> laura, laura laura vander Voort and cm punk and the wrestler and some other people and it it got decent reviews when it came out it looks bad it's got a 55 on rotten tomatoes but like among like fangoria and all that they loved it and i'm like now nah, if you're gonna remake an original like what's considered a masterpiece of the 70s horror f- uh, films you, you have to do it right <laughs> but you, I, you know i'm sorry Aaron, go ahead no no i was i was gonna say that it, but if you want my like favorite cronenberg appearance nightbreed <laughs> yes where he, play, where he plays a serial killer yeah yeah amazing uh, movie jason x is my favorite appearance where he gets speared through <laughs> the gut that was well, awesome well i mean he, he hadn't done a, a you know a heck of a whole ton um what else was he in? He oh he he directed an episode of Friday the Thirteenth, uh, the series called Faith Healer. That might be interesting. Seeing what he could do within the constraints of cable television at the time in the eighties. Um, as far as other acting stuff, yeah, he's you can see him now in Slasher and in, in uh, Star Trek Discovery. Um, I'm assuming he's going to have a lot more stuff coming out. We'll keep an eye on Crimes of the Future. I'm 
I'm going to assume it's not going to be as cerebral as his student style film that he made in 1970, because you, you couldn't make that today with all the actors that are in it. Uh, it says it's a horror film. So I guess this will be his first official horror film since like 1986 on paper. Everything else has been a thriller or a drama. Cause I don't think existence is a horror film. That's like a sci-fi thriller, right? I'd call it cyberpunk noir in a weird way, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Just because like, there's like, the heavy investigative angle, but there's also, here's a gun made of chicken bones, because why not? Yeah, and I know Which that- is actually on display, I think, at the TIFF uh, Museum, because I, I, I did a little bit of research into this last night, and the gristle gun, there are quite extensive photographs of this thing existing in various uh, positions of assembly, but I think the original prop still exists. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, it he lives in Toronto. I mean, it would probably be at some place at one of the studios he made. Um, I know that we'll conclude this on his newest film, Crimes of the Future. Principal photography ended on September 10th, so they're done that. I don't imagine there's going to be a ton of special effects that need to be done or ADR. So... I'm going to expect this movie to probably come out this coming summer. I, I, I can't see it needing more than six months of post-production unless there's major, major problems. But like the cast in this, um, you've got Scott Speedman. I haven't seen him in anything forever. Uh, Kristen Stewart and Viggo Mortensen um, and a few of the other character actors that he usually has in his films. So we'll be checking that out. I, I guess we should probably close this out with... Uh, this has sort of been our month of Halloween Cronenberg episodes. Uh, so happy Halloween. I hope to get this out in the next couple of days. Uh, any final thoughts from you two? Uh, I mean, it was a fantastic experience. I can definitely say he's not my favorite director. He's fine. I am glad I got a chance to experience that. I'm glad I got a chance to really get exposed to his filmography. Uh, next, next month, uh, on Loose Cannon, we're going to be taking a look at the Highlander franchise. We're going to talk about the movies, the TV show. There was even a video game uh, that yeah. was made for, I think, the what was it, Alex? The Sega Saturn uh, or something? No, it was the Atari Jaguar CD. Ah, so we will be talking so, about a system that nobody stuff. can get or play. <laughs> yeah, and if you get one, it doesn't work. Um, so, yeah, we'll be talking about that, and then we're just going to lead up to Holiday Gift Guide that'll be coming up in just over a month and change. I, I, and I know that we're talking sometime uh, in December before Christmas, we'll do an episode on, was it Santa Claus Conquers the Martians? We'll do that with uh, the two of us, Aaron and Darlene, probably. Uh, as a, a bit of a crossover fun because i've never actually seen that film oh it's 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 a chore <laughs> it's, okay. maybe, it's it's maybe, a fun chore that's maybe, the thing it, it's maybe a crazy movie maybe we'll pair that with something uh so it's a bit of the 50s and maybe something have you seen krampus before i have okay maybe we'll see, i'll try to find another christmas themed one that we can watch or maybe i don't know maybe uh, do you have know of any uh hanukkah based horror films Oh my God! No, eight um, crazy <laughs> nights. Um, what, you I, know, there's... I was I was going to make a bad joke and say uh, Schindler's List, but that's <laughs> that's oh, no. dark. Oh, that's a yeah, dark one yeah. there. Yeah. But no, I was going to say that I don't think there is one. Like there hasn't been like a a a horror film because like, there's a horror film for basically every type of holiday you can imagine, and every regardless of of religion or that. But I just don't think I've ever heard of one that's like a specifically Jewish holiday horror film. I think well, we there could, might we, be, but I'm not sure. We could do um, the Discworld Hogfather uh, what is TV that? show. It, well, it's it's look up Discworld Hogfather. It's a sort of holiday um, thing dealing with death as one of the main characters. It's, yeah, from the Discworld. Terry Pratchett's okay. Discworld. I'll take a look and see if we can get a hold of something there. And if not, we'll find something else that like Santa Claus Conquers the Martians is, I believe, in public domain. We can probably grab a couple things because it would be nice if we could talk about something that we can pop up on YouTube and anybody can watch. Yeah, sure. Because I know there's been like a Criterion release of the Santa Claus one, but um, I'm sure that, I'm sure there's something strange and weird we can find that we can do and talk about that'll be fun. Uh, and then 
I guess we're back to normal come January, Mike. Is that the idea? Uh, but so yeah, we're probably going to come back uh, second week of January, so we get um, about a month and change off. But we will have content for Stargate and some other stuff uh, coming out during that time. We're just gonna we've just been delayed a few weeks in getting started just because. Um, Lots of stuff going on. Yeah, yeah. There's just a lot of moving parts we didn't quite anticipate. So uh, things are going to be coming along. Don't worry. You will be hearing stuff before Holiday Gift Guide before too long. All righty. So uh, I guess, should I close out the show, Michael? Yes, you should. So for <laughs> Loose Cannon, I've been Mike the Birdman. Uh, I'm Aaron Pollier. And Alex, the producer, I will be editing this and we'll be having it out so you can listen before Halloween. Good night, everybody. Are either one of these any good? Sir. What? Are either one of these any good? I don't watch movies. Quick, change the channel. You're wasting your life making shit. Nobody cares. These movies are terrible. You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Thanks for listening to this episode of This Week in Geek. Hungry for more? Check out our website at thisweekingeek.net. You can subscribe to the podcast, browse our Twitter and Instagram, and leave your thoughts on today's topics. If you'd like to give us some feedback, send us an email at feedback at thisweekingeek.net. Tune in next time, and remember shields and surrender your listenership we would be honored if you would join us thank you for your cooperation good night what can i do to make your lunch more pleasant i found this in my soup and i'm very upset